Park, uh, particularly on a West Ham kind of home uh, home game. So, Satoshi Block Dojo, what is it? Okay, so it is an incubator program, so which is distinct from an accelerator program um, because clearly it's earlier stage. And the idea being is is we have three of these a year. We call them cohorts: January, February, March, May, June, July, September, October, November. So. What we're trying to do is very different than most incubators and accelerators out there. And let me explain why. So typically, an incubator accelerator will give you a bit of desk space, they'll do a bit of training. When I say training, we do enormous amounts of workshops, we do huge amounts of one-to-ones, we have master classes, we have boot camps. But that's only kind of a part of the story. We've got Jan, in fact there's a few mentors here tonight, We've got 70 mentors that our startups can kind of cherry pick from, and they're allowed to have five mentors. And these guys are like world class and like seasoned professionals helping them with their business. But again, that's only part of the story. Because where we exceed and where we go kind of three steps further than anybody else is we really want to make sure that what they're solving a real world problem, right? There is nothing worse, and I have invested in a lot of shit companies that have gone nowhere, right? And, and it's really annoying, because what you need to do is problem, solution, fit. All right, are they creating something of real world value, and does it make sense? And that's what we, we put them through. We, 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 we call it the ninja assassin, assassin, right? But we try to kill their business and make sure what they're producing is something real and valuable. So the object of the exercise, unlike most investor presentations, is they have something real at the end of 12 weeks. They've got an MVP. And out of eight, we managed to get six MVPs over the line. Minimal viable product. Real world stuff. Not just some clickable kind of PowerPoint, you know, Photoshop nonsense. Actually something real. So an investor can look at it and go, wow, that makes sense. And then the other area we go kind of three steps further is we go and identify real world clients. There's nothing better than actually talking to a client who you're hoping to sell to and getting feedback and iterating the solution. So that's what we're doing. And there's a ton of activities we're doing in the background, which frankly is exhausting. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm checking myself into the Betty Ford Clinic on Saturday because we're 12 weeks in and it is a slog. So the one question we get asked more than any other question is, why is it just the blockchain, right? Why is it not like tech stars, jack of all trades, kind of like tech training school? And, and there's a simple, I can narrow it down to two words. Massive opportunity. <laughs> and the reason being is that, you know, we all kind of have heard about the blockchain, it's kind of the next big thing. But I was like, it sounds really complicated and actually frankly boring. And then I had an opportunity when I sold my last company, 
for those lovely people at Zoopla for a reasonable tiny sum. And I was on my hammock in Antigua, and I was able to finally do some research into the blockchain. And the deeper I went, and the more I uncovered, it became more weird and exciting. It was like, holy shit, this is a massive opportunity that the world has not woken up to yet. And it felt like going back to the start of the internet. You know, and I, I missed the opportunity there, and I've breathed the day ever since. And I vowed I was never going to do the same again. So that, that was one part, was I actually did some research. The other part was, the present internet is a leaky old bucket. It is not fit for purpose. And do you know why? Because the underlying technology was created in 1973. Can you believe that? 50 years ago. And it hasn't changed a jot since. We all know huge amounts of fraud. Right? It's, you know, almost everything you do, you're like, oh Christ, am I getting kind of scammed here? What's going on? Right? We all know that actually the latency issues, I mean, dear God, it is the most appalling system for the transmission of data. It is incredibly inefficient. And, and let's not talk about like the payment mechanism. Does it even have its own payment mechanism? You have to spin out to Visa and MasterCard. And those guys are ridiculously inflexible. I've got a bank in it, they've got an address. They, they, theoretically, they charge actually quite high fees. And therefore, what happens is it favors surveillance capitalism. So you get these megaloplops, or whatever that word is. You get these huge Facebooks and Googles of the world, right? So it's all concentrated in a very small pair of hands. So guess what else was invented in 1973? Any guesses? Me. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> You're 50 years old. Wow. You look amazing, baby. Right. The mobile phone was invented. Martin Cooper from Motorola invented that enormous great brick. And I think we can safely say that the technological advances that have happened in the last 50 years with mobile phones, it gives you a kind of a frame of reference. And yet, look at what has happened in terms of the technology with the internet. Nothing. We have exactly the same protocol which has done nothing in the last 50 years. In the 21st century, it's not fit for purpose. So therefore, as a consequence, I think we can safely say, the internet is due a massive and major upgrade. And that upgrade is the blockchain. Now, the great thing is, finally, bear in mind the Satoshi White Paper was out 13 years ago, <clears throat> corporates and governments are starting to wake up. We all know banks, you know, they're very greedy, but they're not stupid. Some of them have been around 300 years. And they're now starting to wake up to the realization that actually we do need what are called CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. Half the world are digital natives. It's preposterous. I've just come from 10 countries over the last 18 months. The amount of money that I've lost exchanging, you know, Colombian pesos with US dollars and pounds, it's just a nonsense. So let's just remind ourselves why the blockchain, in my opinion, is going to revolutionize and transform this planet. Number one, one version of the truth, right? So we've all heard about you know, the immutable ledger. But what does it mean? What it simply means is that the data is stored and held on multiple servers so nobody can cheat. Because everyone's kind of watching each other and peeping and going, oh, are you cheating, right? Well, that means there's greater transparency. There's less fraud, less waste. A brand new industry. So, okay, this is the best way of explaining this. So, an entire brand new industry will be born with the blockchain. And it's one of those things, you can't really get your head around it because it's not here. But let me give you a tiny little use case in terms of what will, could happen in terms of the blockchain. We've all been doing a bit of research online. We're halfway through an article. It's fantastic. And then up comes that annoying pop-up. Oh, if you want to complete the rest of the article, you have to subscribe to the Washington Post for $8 a month. Goodbye. Whereas if a pop-up came and it said, oh, well, you can read the rest of the article and you're going to get charged 1,000 of a cent, you'd be like, let's go. Now that gives you a small case use case. 
But you look at people's online behavior, you imagine getting rewarded for all various things you did, particularly in terms of the world of social media. And as we all know, it's crazy how we don't have a digital currency. So the great thing is there are 147 major banks in the world from 197 countries. Bank of England being one. We have 88 of those banks who now have big RFIs, requests for information out to the blockchain community, finding out what the hell is, you know, what are these digital currencies? Richard Sunak is ahead of the pack. He kind of understands. So they're looking at digital currencies because once banks start to embrace them, as we all know, they're kind of stupid and annoying, but they're like lemmings. Once one goes, they'll all go. Turing complete, what does that mean? Alan Turing, our very own homemade genius from Manchester. So essentially what that means is the, the present internet is dumb. It's a useful information retrieval lookup system and nothing more. Turing complete means actually it is this giant uber brain. It can figure things out. It can find out where there's inefficiencies. It can reward efficiencies. It can actually computate everything in real time. And then we've got the developing world. Did you know 25% of this planet are completely disenfranchised from the internet, or at least from the transactions on the internet? And the reason being is because all roads lead to Visa and MasterCard. So imagine, again, let me give you a little use case. Some guy on $2 a day catches a few fish, has to sit in the blazing sunshine at the side of the road trying to sell those fish. Now imagine, all of a sudden, he has the ability to be able to plug in online and sell those four fish for a couple of dollars and get charged a thousandth of a cent. All of a sudden, he's got opportunities to sell to restaurants or to shops or to whomever, right? But that's not happening at the moment, and this is what the power of the blockchain will do. It will empower poor people to utilize this online uh, amazing internet. Eco-friendly, don't get me going about eco-friendly. We get lumped into the same bucket as those energy hogs, BTC and Ethereum. And it winds me up. The present, our blockchain is the most eco-friendly thing you could ever have. <coughs> Than certainly compared to what we have presently. <coughs> so, back to investor interest. Now, I would guess everybody here could have like a little tickle. Most people, apart from the students in the back. You can have like a, you know, you can have a little kind of punt in terms of investment. So, the, kind of the minimum investment in our companies is £5,000. But the great news is that £5,000 you get two and a half thousand pounds back from the government very quickly. So let me tell you. First of all, why should you maybe chuck five grand into one of our companies tonight? Well, because it's the start of the internet, essentially, there's gonna be loads of unicorns, right? Brand new companies that have never kind of seen the light of day will emerge. So you may be, you know, for a five grand punt, you never know you might be back in the next Google. Scale globally, they always state the internet can, but it isn't, it's a hodge, hodge of nonsense. Whereas actually the blockchain is a unified global system. SEIS, if anybody knows anything about this, UK, we have the most magnificent, generous scheme for, to encourage investors to put money into startup companies. And that is why in the UK, we create more startups than the entire European Union combined. Yorkshire does more startups than France. Can you believe that? One, one county of um, belligerent northerners, right? So they can even do a better job. So what that means is we are protected by the government, HMRC, who go to check our companies out, they check their financial models, they check their business plans, their pitch decks, and they give them a green light and they say, right. Okay, these guys pass. Once they do that, you are protected as an investor to the tune of 75%. It's unbelievable. And no one believes it. Whenever I tell them at a dinner party, they go, no, that can't be right. And here's the kicker. If they are wildly successful after three years, they pay, you pay zero capital gains tax. 
No tanks. I've done this a number of times. It's all legal. It doesn't sound legal, but it is. It's all legal. But the whole point is, is that it's because early stage companies are usually higher risk. If they're part of an acceler accelerator program or an incubator program, they are significantly re uh, lower risk because we've actually kind of beaten them into shape. All right, and also, I know my last company, to Zoopla, I was out in three years and 10 months. The previous company, I was out in just a shy of five years. I believe we're actually gonna have lots of exits who are gonna get bought up and snapped up. And the reason being is because most corporates have been kind of holding back. They know the, the blockchain is enormous and huge and which, which chain is it gonna be? And are the banks going to um, adopt uh, CBC, CBDCs? Once that happens, there will be an almighty great gold rush. And the best way for a corporate to get ahead of the pack is to buy their way to the front. I think there'll be a whole load of companies that snap up. Right, do <laughs> Here, here's the, uh, uh, here's the big one. Are you ready? So, deluded. Am I deluded? Well, I'm willing to, to make a significant wager. And you guys in the audience here are the witness, witnesses. I state here and now that all eight companies will be fully funded through our Dojo program. Now, as a wager, you have to have a consequence. And the consequence that I'm prepared to do is that the next investor meeting, if I do not get all eight fully funded, then the presentation I will make will be nothing more than a Peter Stringfellow <laughs> a leopard skin thong. And guys, <laughs> For the avoidance of doubt, that is a truly hideous sight. So, so, investors, if you want to spare yourself that horror, I would urge you to throw five grand into our startup and get them over line. So, guys, thank you so much. I'm going to hand you over now. <laughs> So look, as the program director of Satoshi Block Dojo, it's my responsibility to curate and execute the program. It has been an absolute privilege to have worked with such an amazing group of founders throughout the last 12 weeks. So thank you. Thank you for trusting me. Thank you for trusting the dojo. Thank you for trusting the process. I also need to thank some more people tonight. This works. Um, I need to thank the team, but I really do need to thank our team of associates. The group that have been working around the clock, sometimes outside of hours and weekends, and I just want to say thank you so much to all the associates that have joined us in the program. Can we please get a few minutes? The other group of people that I really need to thank are the mentors and the coaches that have been so supportive throughout the program and have really leaned in and helped out all of the companies. And I'm sure that there's going to be relationships where you're going to still continue those far beyond the 12 weeks. So can we get another huge round of applause for the mentors? <laughs> Because I'm new to the BSV community, but I have been welcomed, and the Satoshi Block Dojo has been welcomed with open arms. So again, thank you so much for that warm welcoming and for your continued support. Can we get a round of applause for the BSV community? <laughs> and the last one, and I'll be done. <laughs> you're, not, you're not far off. Because I actually wanted to thank the unsung heroes, the families that don't often get the recognition, the families that are supporting the founders throughout the 12 weeks. They're very much a part of this process with us. So thank you, please. A round of applause for all the
Mike Charles, and this is Neil, the move from Buzzbit. And can you help us make an NFT? I'm not asking you that question, but this is a question that we get asked, uh, especially over the last six months by media companies and brands um, who want to enter into this space. And it's a good question, right? Because right now we're building out a SaaS-based platform that allows these enterprises and brands to take control, to digitize their assets, and to enter into the metaverse. So the next question we get asked is, <coughs> so can you help us build that out an NFT project? And the reason that we get asked this question so often is if in 2021, the NFT marketplace was led by punks, apes, and other name things, in 2022, it's being led by brands who recognize the huge strategic financial opportunities that entering into the NFT marketplace can offer them. So what are some of the problems that these brands face? Well, let's just take publishing as one example. It's an area in an industry that both myself and Neil have worked in for over 30 years, which is why we're so incredibly youthful looking. Uh, so what they're facing at the moment is crashing ad revenues, falling circulations, and the spectre of paywalls. And these are just some of them. So right now, at this moment, we are talking to iconic British publishers about digitising their legacy assets, about releasing huge amounts of value that they're just sitting on, gathering dust. We're also talking to fashion brands about the possibility of creating new IP. Let me give an example. A fashion brand might have a pattern, a piece of cloth or material, and they may create that into an NFT, sell it, and then the owner of that NFT can create a new pattern using that pattern. So they're creating new IP. These are some of the people we're referring to. And we're talking to sports brands about uh, NFT uh, tents and auctions, iconic sporting moments, and, uh, and key points from, from games and so on. But why are they talking to us? Well, for starters, we've been in this space for quite a long time, not necessarily NFTs, but we've been publishing. However, we also happen to have a marvellous set of mentors, which Craig referred to earlier, some of which are sitting within this audience, and we thank you all because you've been absolutely spectacular. But why aren't these people and these brands using external NFT marketplaces? And actually, this is a great question because it comes down to three distinct characters who we've met along our journey leading to this point. And they are called FOMO, Info, and Omo. Now, FOMO, every single brand has a massive FOMO sitting somewhere in an office. Right? They just want to get into the NFT marketplace. They want to make as much money as they possibly can. They're not bothered about what blockchain they build on, how fast or how scalable or how safe it is. They just want to get straight in there. And then we've got info. Now, info is just even concerned how somebody even buys an NFT. Will one of their readers have to download a digital wallet? Will they have to fill it with cryptocurrency? Does the marketplace that they could send their clients to even reflect their brand value? And then finally, we've got owner. And owner is the killjoy of every single company because they just don't want to get into the NFT marketplace at all. They're worried about basically NFTs being stolen, about their customers paying, having to pay huge gas fees. Uh, they're worried about diving into sort of open seas where monsters may lurk. For those of you who know, you can see we get that joke, hopefully. <laughs> and then uh, finally, we have all these characters merged together and they create one singular character called Fofu. Now, FOMO would stand for Fear of Missing Out. Any ideas what Fofu stands for? <laughs> Somebody fear of something. Fear, fear, fear of fucking hell. <laughs> so, yeah, so fear of fucking hell. So, it's nearly the weekend, right? So, you have to forgive me. And, uh, and, and Fofu is basically the boss when it comes to who makes the decision within brands and within enterprises. So what does Fofu want? Well, they essentially want the same thing as FOMU. They want to get into the NFT market. They want to be able to release huge amounts of equity from their uh, legacy assets. But they are scared of the same things that FOMO and Info and especially OMO are. They don't want their brand damaged. And for that very reason, they are saying to us over and over again, we do not want to send our readers to external NFT marketplaces because we cannot control them. So they've turned to us, quite literally, 
and Ed Sill, a very famous newspaper, printed and said, can you help us build a marketplace where we can actually ideate and create and deploy NFT projects of real utility? And we turned around and we said, well, yeah, we can actually. And we then asked them, would you like us to build this marketplace on the most fastest, scalable, and eco-friendly blockchain that is out there? And they surprisingly said to us, that would be fantastic as well. And then they said, especially if that marketplace can help us enter into the Web 3.0, into the metaverse, and take advantage of a scalable economy that is growing from 25 billion in 2021 to 80 billion in 2025 and 350 by 2030. And we took a step back, we planned, we came into the dojo, and we built Buffalo. Thank you. Not only uh, does he just want to create a new startup company, he wants to create an entire metaverse, right? And for those of you who uh, don't really understand the metaverse, I didn't. Um, it's a bit like Second Life. You remember that thing, that kind of clunky old with like really bad graphics? Well, it was enormous and highly addictive. Essentially, it's a 3D virtual world, and you can create lots of different characters. But what these guys have done is figure out how to actually monetize uh, sort of Second Life a million times better. So, and I'll give you a case in point. So their metaverse, they've cut a deal with loads of architects and construction companies. Now again, it's kind of genius, because they have loads of these CAD drawings just sitting there on disks doing nothing, right? What, what better opportunity than kind of to drag it out of those servers and actually create a metaverse with all these kind of CAD drawings? It's saving millions of pounds of development, and it's accelerating the process instead of having to wait a year to actually build. You can, you can populate it with lots of interesting buildings. But here's, that's only a small part of what they've done. You imagine there are 40,000 influencers in the UK with over a million people, just in the UK alone. And what these people are desperate to do is drag more cash out of their user base, right? So monetizing their base is what they call it. So what um, Cosmos X have come up with is they've got one of these amazing kind of very high-tech apartment blocks largely from kind of China because the co-founder is Chinese and she's done she's got lots of deals with construction and architects over there. And it's all very super high tech. But they're putting a an amazing penthouse on the top of it. And they're making that penthouse relevant and appropriate to the different influencers. So if it's somebody from the music industry, it might be a pool, the shape of a guitar, or a grand piano, for instance. Now, you're like, well, okay, that sounds all a bit weird. But then what is the influencer going to do? They're then going to contact their million user base and they're going to rent out these apartments or sell these apartments or have uh, virtual pool parties or in the, uh, in the ground floor, they're going to have a boutique and they're going to be, be able to showcase their product placements. So it's a perfect opportunity to then get influencers to get excited to then monetize their base. Now, does this sound Crazy, <laughs> kind of. Welcome to the, 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 the world of the metaverse. But does it sound ambitious? Yes, it is. But the great thing is, you can always, the greatest predictor of what somebody is going to do is what they've done in the past. And Matthew, the CEO, has already had a successful tech exit. He sold his last company for 15 million pounds. So they're forecasting 26 million revenues by year three with reasonable assumptions not a barking mad financial model, I assure you. So ladies and gentlemen, please say hello to Matthew. Thanks, Craig, and thanks everyone for coming along today. Really appreciate it. So welcome to Cosmos X. So let's kick things off today with a question. What is the metaverse? So is it 3D, open world, e-commerce? Maybe it's a mixture of all three. No one really knows, but we've got our own vision of the metaverse. We're creating a system that brings users, creators, and investors together in a single platform. So let's start with the most important part. The most important part of those is the user. Let's start with the user. 
you enter the metaverse and you are born. And what do you do? The first thing you want to do is take a look around. So let's go. So here you can see lots of buildings, lots of shops, businesses. We've got premier investment companies. We have streets named after the fastest blockchain in the world. We've even got down here buildings with the most prestigious BSV incubator in the world. There's a, there's a, your apartment's right at the top, Craig. But my apartment's higher. <laughs> so you can have a look around the metaverse, the Cosmos X city. Now, there's no such thing in the real life as a free lunch, and there's no difference, unfortunately, in the metaverse. You need to think of how you're going to pay if you want to go and buy something. In the real world, sometimes you meet an estate agent which says this apartment is 30 square meters, and it turns out to, turns out to be 29. You don't need to worry about that. In the metaverse, it's all priced in megabytes. So it's all stored on the blockchain, and everyone knows what they're getting, and it's stored securely. So, you've got some money. You might want to buy a nice mountain view apartment. You could have a little penthouse apartment, or you could buy an apartment in the same building as your favorite celebrity or influencer. If you've got enough money, you're going to view the cosmos. So you've got your apartment, you need to put something inside. So we've got 3D marketplace, you can buy pianos, sofas, all of the different accessories you need for your apartment. But what if you've got, not got any money? You need to find a job. So we've got the job center, and in here, users will find all of the different activities like learn to earn, play to earn, and build to earn, where you can create your own 3D assets, upload them, and sell them. So we've got plenty of opportunities to earn money in, in the Cosmos Sex Metaverse. And we've got our own um, rates to earn, so we're going to do like a trust pilot rating system. Now, you're making money there, how can you do more? Well, you can join the Directors Club, and then you can run your own business here, you can hire people in there, and you can get virtual assistants, AI assistants running and, and helping you in your own little business in the metaverse. If you're still confused, we've created a collection of these intelligent uh, alien NFTs, and these will actually guide you. So they're going to guide the investors, tell them what to invest in. They're going to recommend things to the investors. They're going to help the, the creators build things, and they're going to help the users through their journey as well. So, we've seen some pretty pictures and videos there, and animations, and user stories. Where's the business? That's what you're here for. So, we've got three problems here that we've identified. We've got the influencers who have no control, no visualization on their uh, followers. We have the dying high street problem, as everyone knows. And we've got massive confusion in the general public of what is the metaverse and NFTs and blockchain. So those are the problems that we're going to address. So we've got three vertical applications here on top of our platform. The first is the influencer ecosystem. We're going to give the influencers control. Uh, they can monetize, they can visualize what their followers are doing. And it's all stored in the blockchain and visualized there. Those followers are going to come in and they're going to revitalize those dying high street um, shops by bringing in um, new, new, new business to them. And then we're going to link that together. So the virtual high street, we're going to allow the old shops to then start selling things like NFT vouchers. And then that's going to allow the um, users to, to learn more about their products in our rating system. So we've kind of got a synergy between all these three vertical applications in our system. So in terms of revenue streams, well, we've got quite a few of them. But we've got the, the basic things like land sales, um, renting. We've got royalties from the NFT marketplace, recommendation systems. Quite a lot of things we can put in here to, into Metaverse. Now, in terms of the market size, well, it's growing at about 40% per year for the next 10 years. It's going to be pretty big. And so there's plenty of space for actually multiple metaverses, even it could be an infinite number of metaverses, who knows? In terms of our team, sorry, in terms of our financial highlights, um, we've got some good projections here. Um, and these projections are actually quite conservative. We've seen other, other kind of similar brands going from zero to 200 million users in four years. So even with these you know, conservative projections, we've got some good um, revenue projected there. And that's the investment distribution on the right hand side. So in terms of our team, I'm supported by my partner, Shao at the back. 
Um, she's got all of the um, partnerships in China arranged, um, and she's great at 3D designs, all those 3D stuff that was done by Xiao. And myself, um, I've been doing startups for the last 20 years. Um, I've had offices in China, Singapore, uh, Australia, and that was my exit here. So I've got experience in building these, in these companies and doing the uh, affiliate uh, marketing and all of the different te te technical side as well, including the call center side, which I'm quite uh, good at. So, to summarize, we believe there's a really good opportunity here. We've got the combination of three things. We've got the virtual reality, internet, and blockchain all coming together to provide this real um, exciting area to invest in. So I hope we can blast off into the metaverse together, and we'll see you in Cosmos X. Thank you. <laughs>
18 percent. Wow, I thought you said 18. Sorry, <laughs> 18 percent. And that's not the best of all. We're also implementing NFTs with exclusive bragging rights. We let you have exclusive access to the high definition image of an NFT. You can use that to brag to your friends that you own, you own this exclusive piece of art. So let's talk about the art market. This is probably one of the most, uh, this is probably one of the biggest markets tackling blockchain at the moment. They are ready for blockchain adoption. Just in the UK, the art market is $10 billion. And the NFT market in the last quarter of 2021 is $7.4 billion. We plan on accessing a slice of that and make our money out of it. So we're asking for 140,000 SEIS investment to increase our marketplace, to develop it further, and increase our list of artists, collectors, and dealers. So come join me. Let's bring the past, the present, and the future together. Let's bridge the physical and the digital with blockchain. Next entrepreneur. <laughs> this next entrepreneur is bringing fun and excitement and gaming to the blockchain. It gives me great pleasure to invite to the stage Richard, the CEO of Ninja Punk Girls. Thank you, Alex. Um, let's have a look and see if this works. Right, okay, hello everyone, my name is Richard Bogues. Thanks for coming along tonight. Um, and I'd like to introduce Ninja Punk Girls versus the evil Aerobots. Now, this, <laughs> let me first start by saying I'm actually um, a kind of accidental co founder of the Block Dojo itself. And one of the reasons that I really wanted to start a company on blockchain was I wanted to do this. This is my passion project. Uh, I was living in Tokyo about 10, 12 years ago. I came up with this. The Aerobots are living in a toy district in Harajuku. And something that I wanted to do for a long time. I wanted to do it on blockchain back in 2012, and I was stopped from doing it because of the way they changed the code in BTC. So I'm very pleased to be able to start doing these kinds of things on chain. Right. So let's have a look. During the program, we released 650 of these NFT cards. I sold about we sold about 550 of them for two pounds each. Of course, microtransactions allow us to sell many, many tokens at scale. For tiny, tiny transaction fees, um, we take seven percent on every every subsequent trade as well of any of the NFTs we sell. Um, there are thirty unique characters. Some of them are modelled on my friends, one of whom is here tonight, Hello Marina. <laughs> um, series two is we've released today, and it's three. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, on uh, RelayX.com, it's 3,333 unique characters, and we're selling them for £8.88 or roughly $9.99 um, starting today. That's right. And you can see we've got various features in here. So these are a bit of an upgrade to the normal NFTs. What we've done is we've put a battle system on there so that you can play against each other. Because what we want to pioneer is the idea of penny battling. Now, Craig usually does a very good introduction speech for me, and he explains the whole thing. Essentially, this is Top Trumps, right? In Top Trumps, there was always the red Ferrari. It came out, you knew you were screwed. In this, we have potentially billions of permutations, but we've cut it down to just 3,333 for this series. And the idea is that you don't actually know uh, the winning card, right? So you're going to choose bits and uh, pieces to, to battle against each other. And ultimately, you can wager 10p, and the company would take half of the half of the, half of the revenue for that, that game, and the winner would take the other. So we've got 400 individual. I explained that badly. Actually, each player wagers 10p. The company takes half. The winner gets the other 10p. 
We've got 400 individual elements in this series. We've got this unique battle system, as I described. And we've actually got something really interesting and new, which no one else seems to be doing, which is nested NFTs. NFTs inside other NFTs. Now, the company controls those things, but it means if, you're, if you have a winning card and you're playing against other people and you're winning cards and elements into your card, the value of your card goes up. So you can then sell it for a higher amount. Also, what we want to do is give, um, I keep thinking this is a microphone in this uh, is tickets into a 3D fighting game like Tekken. Tekken was one of my favorite games when I was a kid. Uh, Street Fighter 2, for any of you who remember that, you used to go and put 10p in and play against your friend. You never won 10p off your friend. That's what we'd like penny arcades to be. So if you imagine this is now possible with digital cash, imagine the size of the potential market. So in this game, players battle for prizes as well, elements, as I said, player cards, and potentially ninja punk bucks as well. DeFi is very big, and we are looking very seriously at that uh, possibility. Fortune Business Insights paid the, the gaming industry at $200 billion uh, last year, with about $4.8 billion in revenue. So you can see it's growing and growing, and actually, out of all of the th these three parts of the blockchain industry, NFTs, DeFi, and gaming. Gaming is the one that's getting in speak. It's the one that's getting bigger and bigger. So the main takeaway from this is, here are the main studio, uh, game studios in blockchain these days. There's lots of them, so lots of competition, but they're all building on these blockchains that don't scale. None of these blockchains have scaling mechanisms. As they get bigger and bigger, they get more and more expensive and more and more congested. Right? What's the answer? Uh, <laughs> actually, the answer is Bitcoin SV, but let's, let's take a little side, side bit here for Axie Infinity. Axie Infinity are building on the rolling side chain to so Ethereum. Why? Because Ethereum doesn't scale. They have a market cap of about $2.8 billion. Last year, they made $600 in revenue, and last week, they were hacked, the Roman sidechain was hacked for $650 million, right? The whole revenue from last year. Why? Because they're building on insecure technology. They're jumping from chain to chain. Multi-chain worlds don't work. They're a bad idea. So of the roughly 10,000 public blockchains that are out there at the moment, none of them scale, none of them have scaling mechanisms, except for Bitcoin SV, right? Bitcoin SV scales to support digital cash for 8 billion people. Wow. So what does that mean? It means what we want to do, well, I'm going to actually go back a little bit. Uh, what we want to do is build tools, build exchanges, so that when those gaming companies come over from the blockchains that don't scale, and they come onto the one that does, we'll be waiting for them with our battle system. We want to license them with exchange technology. So what we're looking for is 250,000 pounds, 70,000 pounds of that is to build out this multi-protocol NFT exchange that will capture a significant portion of those game studios that are coming over to the public blockchain this week. We want 12,000 for the next three series of cards. We want 68, we're asking 68,000 for blitz scaling of marketing budget, get the word out there and really push the product, and 100,000 for game development. We're looking at multiple revenue streams. Um, we look to do a new limited series every three months. Lots of merchandise, toys, clothes, posters, comics, cartoons, and also this penny arcade revenue that I mentioned. In addition to that, we'd like to license the battle system to larger players like Nintendo or Konami. As I said, we take 7% exchange fees on all the traded cards. We think the cost per acquisition of each player is about five pounds, and we aim to accumulate a thousand players month on month. The goal is to be the next Pokemon, to sell 100 million cards for a pound each. So why me? As I said, I am part co-founder of the Lockdown. Uh, I go back in Bitcoin a very long time. I used to write for Coindesk. Uh, my deep past is graphic designer, uh, video motion graphics artist, uh, and producer, producer for Playboy TV. Uh, I have some, we have obviously strong connections uh, with Robin of Viax, uh, Bitcoin Association, Enchain and CoinGeek, and I'm supported by a very strong team. 
Alex, my CTO, who's here sitting at the back, has been in Bitcoin for nine years. He's a senior software engineer and Bono cloud architect. Uh, he's very, very uh, knowledgeable and skillful. He's built Bitcoin exchanges and things like that before. Uh, and Javier Rodriguez is our developer, who's actually Alex's uh, part, technical partner as well. So we're supported by Ava Pasco at the retail practice, Mal Malavika Salenki, who's a Techstars mentor, Melvin Francis from uh, Bitstamp, who's very positive about our project, and of course David Guppy, who's the ex CEO of the BNO now, PC Thompson, and he's very positive about this too. So uh, we have Twitter, we've got 3,000 followers. We've got a Discord, obviously, every good NFT project needs a Discord. And we've got a nice website. Plus, we have some lovely brand ambassadors and influencers, as I mentioned, some of them here tonight. Uh, I have done lots of social media in the last year, particularly promoting Block Dojo. Block Dojo is a company that I love. I'm really excited about it. However, I'm now switching over to Ninja Punk Girls to make that more full time. Uh, full-time occupation. So, if you want to get in contact with me, you can reach me at richard at ninjapuntgirls.com. Thank you. on the minute because plus up will allow my consultation at the micro level. This will, this will open opportunities for everyone around the world, especially people from the developing country to assess cross border consultation. As we're currently living in an era of instant expectations, a generation of impatience, instant messaging, streaming, and access to information. But if you're in a real crisis, does Google always have the answer? Because sometimes you just need to speak to a real human expert to help you out of the crisis. As you can see, this lady is in pain, not that one. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, has a, she got an urgent task for work and she needs to speak to a specialist. But then she picked up her phone and there's no platform that offers instant access to call a professional to speak to. And also, this platform, there's no one that allows her to just call for a few minutes. On the other hand, is a freelancer who this, who this lady is looking up to to receive this to, to call and uh, provide service to. He has no platform where he can monetize his phone calls and messages. The current method in which he does it is archaic and involves chasing invoice, extortion net payment fee, and um, delays in payment. So the solution is PlusApp. PlusApp allows these freelancers to monetize their time by the minute by message or a consultation and receive their payment instantly in one app and you can also cash out into your bank account. The solution for the for the customer like the lady there is a micro consultant. So why are we building this now? We believe people are ready to monetize their time by the minute. It's already big business for freelancers to monetize their time, even with the current archaic methods available. Around 800 million in profit was brought in by the current high-end expert networking platforms in the US. And Upwork, the largest freelance uh, network, is currently worth 2.6 billion. Freelancing as a whole, uh, the gig economy spent about 4.5 trillion in 2018. And by 2027, in the US, we're predicted to have more gigas than non-gigas engaging in the freelance economy. And so at Plus App, we're tapping into this massive opportunity and gap in the market to bridge together two currently disconnected industries, which is online communications and instant payments, to open up opportunities. And how do we make money? 
We make more money as us app. If our customers are making more money. So we do that by taking a small commission on calls, video calls, messages, and taking a 2% uh, commission to only cut PayPal's transaction fees. We'll also take um, sales of digital assets such as plus handles. But the most exciting uh, revenue comes in phase two, as we're going to bring to market the very first uh, group calling pay per minute service that no other competitor has yet tried out. And then there'll also be streaming uh, on recorded video sessions commissions. We've got a diverse team here. Uh, here is Laura, and she's the CEO and the founder of PlusUp. Laura was an MSc with distinction in cyber security. She's, um, she's, she has over five years experience in sensor marketing. And uh, the good news to our investors is that she's a certified internal auditor with great passion for risk management. And Ikwini is our CEO. He is an uh, engineer with MSC Distinction Level. He also has a rich background in construction project management. And he's also opening up opportunities for us to expand in Nigeria and some of the larger African uh, countries. Even more exciting is our lead developer currently in India, so he can't join us, but he is bringing this great opportunity to launch in India later on this year as well. Oh, this is the brilliant man behind Plaza. We have. Um, Brand ambassadors and customer numbering in over 70 who have indicated interest and are willing to promote our platform once it is launched. So we're currently halfway through our funding round at the moment that we're asking for a total of around 250,000 to 8%. We're predicting over 900,000 in revenue after the launch of pounds and euro payments in the UK and in Europe. And our spend will be across quite an even split between sales marketing, development of phase one and two, and also extra admin and expenses. Um. What is going on here? <laughs> That's busy. But don't bother reading us. Don't bother reading. Um, it's just there to show you that we've got a, a solid roadmap. Every, everything is well planned out to even to the smallest details. And currently, we've already achieved an MVP that's been built on iOS and Android that we're testing internally. We've launched a website, which is currently under optimization, and we've secured two UK trademarks plus that, plus handles, which we're expanding, and some very exciting partnerships for payments. So we have Modular Bank in the UK and Europe, and then we have a Vinex for Bitcoinicity and Bottle Pay for BTC payments. Of course, we are passionate about uh, customer service. Our system is such that um, the service product provider is incentivized to maintain quality at all times as people can drop their phone call should the quality drops. We are also passionate about uh, bringing communities and people together again through a shared love and respect for each other's time. Thanks. Thank you very much for your time. I see you in the value of the going to talk about technology today, but I will talk about how we use technology to make a difference. It's now or never. Our planet is at a critical point fighting against climate change. Climate change is not only impacting on our daily lives. It's impacting on our business. It's impacting our, on our next generation. It's impacting on the way we will be doing business. COP26 is one of the significant toll for net zero. Companies, corporates, small businesses, they're all struggling to think how to roadmap the way to net zero. There are complex regulation coming up, rules and policies that corporate businesses need to adhere to. So what do we bring? We, Sadgameta, is going to take you on the journey to take control of your sustainability to track, measure, report what is required. We know what is required 
and will help you on that journey. We are currently have a SAS based carbon reporting system where it analyzes your carbon emission, tracking out all your operations, including your supply chain, to ensure that you're going on the right track to achieve net zero. We have a pool of sustainable consultants that will be helping us in that journey, helping the companies in that journey to make it happen. If we can't reduce or make an impact, we can facilitate projects to offset your carbon, which is verified by the gold standard or the VRA standard. And all of these are backed up with a trustworthy, verifiable, and cost-effective solution. Carbon reporting is becoming one of the largest grain sector. If we are here to have a glass of wine, or you're coming to invest, that's the place you need to invest, which makes a difference. We have various cost model that we've put across, starting from the one individual to the corporate, taking the whole journey to achieve the net zero. What is we ask today? We are asking for 250,000 pounds and a strategic partners or partner to assist us with our blockchain integration, our route to market, and for the next stage of funding. We are not the instant unicorn, but our model of income is a SaaS-based, continuous, consistent, and secured income that will facilitate your return on investment on a continuous basis. We have mapped out a route of what we want to achieve in the next 12 months, and it is to make a difference. I wouldn't have been able to do it with a strong team behind me, including the mentors here, who has been opening the door internationally or locally with the like of Brookfields and the others. And why me? I come from a <coughs> tropical island in the Indian Ocean, grew up in the canals and climbing trees, and I've spent 20 years in operations and managing businesses. But I want to make the difference for the next generation, for the businesses, to achieve the milestone, to make a difference to the carbon emission and the climate change. There is only one planet, and if we all can make a difference, we will all have a positive impact on the next generation. Net zero is the next industrial resolution, revolution. If companies, corporate businesses make a difference now, come with us on that journey. Let's make it happen. It's one time chance and we've got less time to make it a difference. If you would like to know more or speak to me afterwards, please talk to me later on. Thank you very much. This next entrepreneur, <laughs> when he entered the dojo, he really opened my eyes into a, he was looking at an industry which is rather taboo and riddled with problems. And he 
wants to tackle those problems and come up with really amazing solutions. I want to invite up to the stage one of the most backable founders I know, Sam, the CEO of Society. Before I do that, I want to ask you all a question. Please do not be shy. Hands up if you've ever thought about creating adult content. Yeah, come on, boy. All of you can see me after I've got the perfect solution to it. Hands up if you've ever searched for adult content. All right, I'd say most of us. Oh, he's a liar. He's a liar. So, statistically, if I asked you all to search for something on the internet right now, one in five of you, through no fault of your own, would stumble across some adult content. It amounts to 20% of all search traffic. <clears throat> so to put that into context, that's more than LinkedIn, Pinterest, Twitter, Instagram, and Netflix combined. But despite this, the industry is heavily stigmatized and the content creators are subject to constant prejudice. So we are Society, an inclusive platform that puts creators first. We help them monetize their content, truly control its distribution, and help them build brand, influence, and audience. We see this creator economy as the one with the highest pay points and the lowest barriers to entry. Over $3,000 is spent every second on adults. That translates to $100 billion globally and will only grow with developments in digital humans, haptic touch, and virtual reality. It's also targeted to be over a quarter of all metaverse revenues. So you're probably wondering why it's me still here talking to you about adult entertainment industry. Uh, <laughs> 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 so, so it's quite about is content distribution and licensing, primarily platform partnerships and innovation uh, for social video on demand platforms. But I started looking at adult because of my friend Susie. Susie is a single mum working in a hospital as a midwife. She started creating adult content as a secondary source of income to support her family, and not only that, she felt empowered. She loved doing it. But what got my attention was Susie kept on telling me all the different issues she was facing. So I was curious. I went out and spoke to loads of creators around the world, the Susies and the Steves, if you like, and I was shocked to find they were all plagued by the same problems. They lacked true control over their content and who could access it. They couldn't get paid quickly, sometimes waiting up to two months for a payout, and they couldn't be discovered with the current solutions geared towards the top 1%. So a society was solving that. We are giving creators back control over the content and they can limit access based on time, user and location. Through peer-to-peer -peer transactions, they can get paid instantly at the point of sale, and so can we. Um, and we'll also help under-service and emerging talent find an audience and be seen. So, oops, sorry. so, we believe that this is what the industry needs, uh, but don't just take my word for it. Here is one of our brand ambassadors, Callie, who's been creating adult content for nearly a decade. Wild, and I've been creating adult content on traditional websites for nearly nine years. This platform is different. This platform is putting control into the hands of the creators for the first time ever, allowing us to monetize our content in ways we never could before, and giving us the confidence to build our brand for a platform that is for us and really wants us there, built by people that truly understand the challenges adult content creators are facing, this platform will disrupt the current industry by showing creators that there is a better way. So where are we? We are testing our platform with different groups of creators and iterating based on their feedback. We've secured five brand ambassadors with a social following of half a million, and we have a further 20 creators who are not just committed to joining the platform as soon as we launch, they want to open up their network and benefit from our referral rewards, where they can earn further fees uh, from their introductions. So, how do they make money? In the short term, it will be uh, content sales, live streams, subscriptions, tips, and messaging. And in the future, we're gonna do NFTs. That could be utility or something a bit more creative, physical merchandise, brand partnerships, and a creative directory. We get paid on every transaction we take a service to. So, by year three, our base target is to have 50,000 creators. That translates to just short of $10 million in revenue. Um, some platforms have done this in a year, so we're quite confident that we can achieve that. Uh, our ambitious target would be uh, 200,000 creators by year three. 
so four times that. So anyway, back to Susie. Uh, someone saw Susie was making adult content and they reported her to the hospital she worked in. If our solution had been available, Susie could have blocked people in her local area, seeing that she was creating adult content, and we could have protected her from the prejudice that she experienced, and she'd still have the job she loved today. We're working with some amazing mentors, advisors, and creators. We're raising $250,000, uh, pounds, dollars, sorry, uh, to get us there, uh, who align with our mission and our values. In no other creator economy are the talents secondary to its user. They're exploited in adults just because of the type of content that they create. Society will rebalance the status quo because there are millions more Susies and Steves out there and they need a better way. Thank you. So, we've reached the last pitch of the evening. I think we've saved the best to last. But I'll let you guys decide. So I'd like to welcome to the stage, all the way from Poland, the CEO of Sound Oshi, Mikhail. Hello everyone. Sound Oshi is on a mission to save music because streaming services are killing it today. This is Alice. She's our friend. She's an upcoming artist. She has 20,000 followers on her Instagram account and she generated 700,000 streams on Spotify this year. And despite the big numbers, she cannot get paid to even make a modest living out of her music. How is this happening? Here is the most average Spotify user you can ever think of. <laughs> and he is listening to Spotify around 400 times a month. He's paying around 400 so it's a month and he's paying $10 in subscription fee each month in order to listen to his favorite artists. And he's expecting that his money is actually going to them because he's, he's, he's listening <coughs> only to them. But in the Spotify model, it's not the case. The money is actually going somewhere else. The money is going to Drake, <laughs> <laughs> to Ed Sheeran, or even worse, it's going to Coldplay. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, jokes, jokes aside, but behind these people is actually the real business. The labels and the publishers, and believe me or not, but they are also not happy with what Spotify offers to them these days. And it's not only because 80% decrease in album sales that happened in the last 15 years, and it used to be their main source of revenue. It's mostly because the lack of transparency. They simply don't understand what's going on inside this black box. And all they know is based on the yearly reports that are being provided to them by the Spotify. So we have the real trust <coughs> issues here. And there is a reason why it's happening. It's because streamings are simply in different business. They are selling subscriptions, not music. And Sandoshi is going to solve the problems they created by selling music again. And we are going to do so by connecting fans and artists in direct play streams where you will be assured that your money is going only to the artists you are listening to and they will be sure they will get paid instantly, not 12 to 15 months right, like it's happening right now in the Spotify. But it's not enough because we want to revive the true soul of music and that's why we are introducing something we consider the biggest music innovation since the iPod. The digital vinyl NFT based on digital ownership provided by the BSD blockchain. So for the first time ever, you will be able to truly own the digital album that you can listen to, trade, or give to your loved ones, and it's going to stay with them forever on BSD blockchain, as it's much more robust than the physical version of the vinyl. In addition to that, all of our digital vinyls include exclusive communities inside, where you will be able to be connected with like-minded people that are also supporting your favorite artists. And you think, if you can think about the music, the most of the good music actually happened years ago, 40, 50, 30 years ago. And we have been thinking about it. That's why we are introducing something we call Sandoshi Music Time Machine, where we are going to take you on the nostalgic journey to the times of past. And we'll make sure that this music experience looks, feels, and sounds like it comes from the times you love the most. And it's all gonna be the part of our reward system because we want to encourage listeners to actually listen to the music and support their favorite artists. And for that, we are going to reward them 
with the music they love. But it's not only about the music, because art is business right now is much bigger. They are selling merchandise. They are selling, yeah, they, mostly they are selling merchandise because that's how they are making a living right now. But in our system, they can live. And they can sell the digital merchandise. They can sell the album covers. They can create the NFT of the lyric snippets of their favorite verses from their songs. They can sell their video clips to their fans. And we have built in ticketing infrastructure that is going to let them to mint and sell their own tickets to their own gigs that can happen either in metaverse or in real world. And after you as a fan attended, we are going to reward you with something we call memory NFT that is going to remind you about these moments years later. So, including all of this, we really believe that we can take artists, publishers, labels, and even streaming services to the new revenue streams through our blockchain as a service infrastructure for music industry that can be integrated into any existing website and app so all of them can benefit from what we are doing. The team is fit on for the purpose here. Uh, we all come from Poland, we are all computer engineers, we are the, the biggest team in the dojo, and believe me or not, but we are building solutions on this chain longer than the dojo exists. And we have an amazing set of mentors that consists of the real veterans of blockchain, music, and internet industry, and they are going to help us to scale it to the global levels. And in order to do so, we are asking you today for 250k of pounds <laughs> <laughs> to, make it, to make it happen. We, we really think we have all the necessary tools to create a huge impact in the music industry in the next years. And we want, you, we want to invite you all to go on this journey with us to help us to build the Sandoshi, the city of sound. Um, guys, okay, let's final few minutes uh, and then we can uh, nip back out and have food and beverage until about 9.30 and then it's the after party, give or take. Right, so um, we've just got a little bit of audience participation uh, which uh, Alex will tell you all about, but we just want to do one little award right now. Now this is Obviously, this is our first cohort, and you're never going to get everything right. So, and of course, uh, that combined with the fact that I'm a complete control freak, so I want absolute feedback. So we have this mechanism whereby they have to kind of go into the barcodes, and they've got to feedback every workshop, every one-to-one, -one, every founder story, every boot camp, every masterclass, right? Non-stop. And it's, it's probably a bit OTT, to be fair. And also, we had like several questions or something crazy. Anyway, all that is getting tidied up for cohort two, you'd be pleased to know. But these poor people are being harangued by me nonstop in terms of their feedback because I want to understand what are we doing badly, what are we doing well, and how do we need to improve things for the next time. Including, I may add, over the weekend, an anonymous survey. <laughs> Why I did that, I will never know, because we allowed them to be able to give feedback on each one of the cohort, uh, one of the dojo members, and of course it's not of us, so they could go for their life. So apparently I am the master manipulator. So. <laughs> 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 Quite accurate, to be fair. So anyway, so as a consequence, we have been dangling a carrot to, to say, okay, whoever fills out more of these absolute kind of annoying kind of feedback mechanism things gets a little prize of a few BSB coins at the end of the process, right? And I can now announce, so if it, you can give a round of applause when I announce, and you can come up and get them. Ladies and gentlemen, the, <laughs> the winner is... Final thing of the uh, evening, and then we can look next door over to Alex. Thanks. Hello, hello, thank you. So, let's get down to business.
we created our very first Satoshi Award, and we thought we would add an element of fun and competition to the pitching tonight. And what we're going to do is we're going to need your help. <laughs> you, you in particular. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to ask everybody to applaud as we go through each of the companies, and the best, the one that gets the most, the loudest, <coughs> the clapometer, that gets the loudest cheers, they're going to win the Satoshi Award. So let's run through the companies. First of all. First of all, we kicked off with Buzzmin. So can I get a round of applause for Buzzmin? Yeah! Yeah! Okay. Can you measure? first. Yeah, yeah, we've got a special platformer over at the side. So. I'm learning from the master manipulator, don't worry. It's a <laughs> Next, we had Cosmos X. Can I get a round of applause? And then after Cosmos X, we had DMA. <laughs> We had Ninja Punk Girls. Yeah. Yeah. And after Ninja Punk Girls, we had Laura and Igwe plus that. Yeah. And after plus that, we had Kevin, who sat in the Thank you so much.